As the saying goes, the older you get and the more things life throws at you, the more you can relate to the villain. And while we all love our favorite Survivor heroes, such as Rupert, Colby, and Sari, sometimes we can't help but root for the villains of Survivor as well. Whether you can just simply relate to them more, they're the underdog of the season, or there's just something about them that makes them rootable despite their villainous persona. What's going on guys, I'm Flint Masters, and today we'll be going through the most rootable villains in Survivor history. Players who are without a doubt villains, but there's something about them that makes them rootable for a niche or even the general Survivor fandom. Now, obviously there's so many players in Survivor history who are ambiguous when it comes to if they're a villain or not. So I'm gonna try to keep this to people who are without question considered villains in the Survivor fandom. There's also plenty of villains through the years who are loved despite not really having any rootable qualities. For example, the hardcore fandom absolutely loves Courtney Yates for her snarky comments with absolutely no remorse or feelings for others. However, I don't think the general person would ever root for a girl like her. So with all that said, let's take a look at the most rootable villains throughout the years in Survivor. And we'll start off with one of the most iconic players in Survivor history, Russell Hance. I mean, Russell is probably the most notorious villain in Survivor history, calling people names, lying nonstop, and backstabbing people even over the pettiest of things. And yet, despite Russell being an iconic Survivor villain, people couldn't help but root for him due to his unreal gameplay. The man found three idols without clues in Samoa when it was unheard of to even find one without a clue in Survivor. He neglected at the time the most amount of votes ever in seven and made it to the final three in two straight seasons. Yet despite his ruthless gameplay, when Russell was loyal, he was loyal as could be, as he stayed strong to his foe foe alliance, despite entering the merge at an 8-4 numbers disadvantage. And then in Heroes vs Villains, instead of playing his idol, or voting for Parvati to survive another day with an idol in his pocket, he risked it all for his alliance with Danielle and Parvati, and Duke Tyson into voting for Parvati, only for him to play his idol on Parvati. All of this at the final 15, with so much gameplay left, this unreal gameplay and loyalty made Russell respected by pretty much all Survivor fans and was able to win fan favorite two straight years. So while Russell was absolutely a villain during his Survivor run, you couldn't help but root for him to stay and root for him to continue to do amazing things in seemingly every single Survivor episode. Now, I don't even have to find idols. People are actually giving me idols. You don't hand the enemy the idol, especially when his name is Russell Hands. You don't do that. That's a no-no. We now move on to Brad Culpepper, a man who is constantly crapped on in every single episode in his short blood versus water run. Brad took control of his tribe right out the gate, something we had seen numerous times in Survivor history. But due to the nature of the season, Brad became not just disliked, but absolutely hated by pretty much every single person out there. Since Brad was the obvious leader, he was the default man to blame when explaining why that person went home. And with this season being full of loved ones, it was not only a double whammy when blaming Culpepper, but this was also personal for the opposing team's loved ones, who had just as much hate for Culpepper, whereas in a normal season, the opposing tribe wouldn't care. The hate for Culpepper escalated in each episode as he continued to be the decision maker on the newbies tribe, and the players voted out continued to rally not only themselves, but their loved ones against Culpepper. And I mean, you couldn't help but feel bad for the guy. He was just simply playing the game, and for that matter, playing it hard, something you have to respect. But with all the emotions of this season, players needed a scapegoat, and Brad was that goat. It got to the point where you were almost rooting for Brad to beat the players that were insulting him at Redemption Island as satisfying revenge. Now to be fair, it's not like Culpepper was a super level-headed person and wore his emotions on his sleeve, along with making it clear to everyone that he was the leader. But still, you couldn't help but feel bad for the guy constantly being crapped on by everyone for simply just playing the game of Survivor. I mean, he was more hated by players this season than some of the biggest douches to ever play Survivor. It's one thing to feel betrayed by someone, but it's another thing to treat someone like garbage for playing the game, and that was Culpepper's experience during his entire Blood vs. Water run, making him very rootable for Survivor fans who did respect his gameplay and knew what the things the eliminated players were saying about him weren't true in the slightest. Just, just, you know, look away. Your child. Monica, every time we come here, your husband gets drilled. All I can say is, there's not just one person voting. 
There's an entire it's been tribe eight to one voting. And four to one. Monica, this is been, a tribe. We've been listening to the people who get voted off about how he's shushing the women I'm and telling them, John, telling them, you can't. Ask your you can't his have I shushed a woman? I've seen Marissa. Ask John. Marissa has shushed. John. When she came to our camp, she ask, felt about this small. Ask your husband if I've hushed anybody. Has you heard me hush anybody? He didn't hush me. No, he didn't hush a man that's bigger than him that can beat his ass. Done, 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 done. This is Brad Havin. Brad Havin. Culpepper stays alive. John stays alive. Candace is out of this game. If there's anyone who certain people can relate to when it comes to a Survivor villain, it's Mr. Randy Bailey. For most people, he was just seen as a grumpy old man who had some less than PC friendly things to say. But for a lot of people, they could simply relate to Randy. He made it clear he hadn't lived the best life and had been hurt by pretty much everything throughout the years. They saw Randy as an introverted guy who had been living a painful 50 years and related to him, whether it was due to being misunderstood or having their heart broken at one point or another in life as well. And most importantly, people who saw through Randy saw that he was a very smart and funny guy who did care about people. It's just that it was super hard for him to get invested in any sort of positivity since he had experienced so much negative in life. Again, people who haven't experienced any sort of negative in life or simply are super positive in general couldn't relate to Randy. But for a large niche of Survivor fans, they not only related to Randy, but also saw that there was some good in him, giving him a cult-like following in the Survivor community. Have you had much tragedy in your life? Maybe. Well... I think that's what help, has helped me. Stuff like this doesn't matter. If I've been first booted off or winner of this game, in, in the long run, neither one matters. It really doesn't. What was the biggest tragedy? Your family thing? Uh, I mean, everything. You know, one, one tops the other. The, the, the dog, you know, the dog replaced the family thing. My dog Johnson uh, meant more to me than any of these people will. He's been dead five years, and I miss him to this day. So the family thing was huge. The thing was yeah, yeah, and, and the dog helped me deal with it. And then when the dog was gone, you know, and the dog was five years ago, and uh, you know, all I've done is deal with it. I'm not the nicest guy in the world. I've I've had a tough 49 years, but uh, Maddie knows if you get me. You're not offended by me. If you don't get me, you go crying home to mama. I thought I was gonna die. I swear to God I did. After your dog? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I didn't eat for about a week. Ended up in the hospital. Did you? Yeah. You know, and then I just decided, you know, this, this isn't worth it. You know, me starving to death is nothing to bring him back. Nothing to be ashamed what of. What do you want in your life now? I want to get a new dog next month. Not like a wife or anything? If that happens, it happens. But no, I'm not planning on it. I'm planning on the dog. I know I, I know I can trust the dog. A similar instance to Russell here, as we move on to Tony Blachos. Tony was a man who got into constant fights, backstabbed his alliance multiple times, and swore on his family and cop's badge, only to break it with no regret whatsoever. Yet, despite all of this negativity, he was able to win Survivor, the first and only over-the-top winner in Survivor history. And because of that, Tony became a beloved character, even before coming back in Winners at War, to cement himself as the greatest to ever play. Not only were fans in love with his gameplay that made for one of the greatest seasons in Survivor history, but unlike Russell, there was an even more hated player in Kageon in Cass that Tony had some of his best fights with. Also, the hero of the season in Spencer was saved multiple times as Tony worked with him sporadically throughout the game, using his vote to blindside people in his alliance when the time was right. Tony is definitely one of the most villainous winners in Survivor history, but nobody can deny how entertaining he was and how entertaining he made Kageon. And even more so now that he's won twice, he is not only respected by the Survivor fandom, but loved for being such a big part of Survivor history. I need to talk to you all. Love him or hate him, Tony played his ass off out here. Wu tries to excuse his passive play on not having idols and Tony finding three idols. Why do you think Tony found three idols? It's because he looked more than everyone else combined. Tony was behind every great strategic decision. He blinded his alliance to what was going on around them in the game like a puppet master. He took a slew of goats deep, put some on the jury. He took one to the end. Tony played with a ferocity this game very rarely does see. 
And so when you put pen to parchment tonight, vote for the only guy sitting there that actually played this game and played it in a way that honors it. We now have one of the only true rootable underdog villains in Survivor history, and that is Jay Starts from Survivor Millennials vs. Gen X. Jay was the typical surfer bro who was very cocky and created the Cool Kids Alliance on the Millennials tribe early in the game and pulled off one of the most ruthless blindsides ever right before the merge on Michaela. Millennials vs. Gen X has one of the most likable cast in Survivor history, with Jay and Taylor being the only real villains of the season due to their shenanigans. From the merge on, Jay slowly became a rootable underdog as he was outcasted right when the merge started, yet was somehow able to make it to the final six through some incredibly ballsy idol holds, immunity wins, and using his million dollar smile to find a way back into the majority. Many viewers also gained a newfound love for Jay after he and Adam bonded over their ailing mothers. While Jay was definitely a guy with a high ego who was easy to root against, especially when going against the likes of David and Adam, everyone loves a good underdog, and Jay was exactly that in Millennials vs Gen X, and was able to make it to the finale when it looked like making the final 10 would be a stretch. You have to respect his never say die attitude, which for a lot of people, made up for his over the top attitude in the pre-merge. I feel as though I'm the protector of, of my family, so why not protect everybody? You just go out there and just have as much fun as you possibly can, and uh, make sure, you know, to just show love. Just show love to everyone. I mean, I've been afraid many, 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 many times, and uh, the strength just came from basically my, my family, just my mother, always reinforcing, like, you can do anything. You can be the best. You are the best. You are the best. And the thing is, with, with, with uh, life, you can't be thinking to yourself, oh, I'm going to do this. You just say you did it already. And then the universe will give it to you. Like, you can't, you can't say, you know, I'm going to be the best. No, you just say, I am the best. Let's end this list with a couple female villains, shall we? You know, it's tough for female villains, cause while some men who play villainous are loved by the community, females that play the same way are despised, especially by the casuals. However, the first female we'll be talking about has nothing to hide, and she'll be the first one to tell you who the queen of Survivor is. And that is, of course, Sandra Diaz Twine. Sandra became known for her sassy personality, telling lies to make others the target over her, and got into many fights in her Survivor career. But these fights are exactly what made Sandra so loved by the Survivor community. Similar to Tony and Cass, Sandra got into an iconic fight with Fairplay in the Pearl Islands, who was far and away the most hated villain of that season. And then in Heroes vs. Villains, for the first time ever, someone stood up to Russell Hans, and that person was in fact Miss Sandra Diaz Twine, flat out telling him she was against him. But what also makes Sandra so beloved despite her less than friendly attitude, is the fact that she owns up to her flaws. She doesn't try to prop herself up like most villains would and get upset when she always has to sit out in challenges. In fact, she embraces being known as the sit out bench queen. She's not the flashiest player in the world, but that's exactly her game. As long as it isn't her, then she can live with that. And it was this type of self-awareness gameplay that made Sandra the first ever two-time winner in Survivor history. Sure, there's some fans who think Sandra is overrated, but many Survivor fans absolutely respect Sandra's gameplay and live for her sassy attitude, especially when going against the likes of Russell and Fairplay. And best of all, no matter what anyone says about her, nobody props up Sandra as much as she props herself up. And you just gotta love it. So, Sandra. Does that does the fact that you're the only person who've won who has won twice does that make you best player ever? It makes me the queen. <laughs> <laughs> the best ever, yes. Without question. Without question. I mean, I have two titles. What else can you ask for? What? I always I, I go out there and my goal is to make it to the end, and I make it to the end, and I win. You can't beat that. <laughs> and finally. How can you not include Miss Poverty Shallow? I mean, it's rumored that she wasn't even supposed to be on the villain's tribe and was only switched due to production wanting to avoid the obvious Black Widow Brigade alliance on the Heroes tribe. And let's be honest, she was obviously a lot more villainous than Ciri and Amanda as she was one of the first female players to use her body to her advantage in Survivor and was the one to create the Black Widow Brigade, the most dominant and ruthless alliance in Survivor history. But still, how can you not love Poverty? Whether it's her endearing smile and laugh, or the fact that she inspired an entire generation of female Survivor players, she is on the Mount Rushmore of Survivor and is still brought up to this day when it comes to a possible Poverty 2.0.
She was a main focus of two of Survivor's best seasons in Micronesia and Heroes vs. Villains, as she was responsible for some of the best moments in Survivor history, such as Ozzy's blindside and her double idol play at the merge in Heroes vs. Villains. Parvati used her sweet personality to her advantage to play some of the best Survivor we've ever seen, and is a franchise face in Survivor history for her cutthroat gameplay despite her appearance. She truly did revolutionize the game, and the fans will always love her for that. Except for when the rootable young female is taken out due to being a potential Parvati 2.0. Coming back and playing really aggressively and pretty much it's no holds barred for me. So I haven't been here miserable going through all this crap to not win this game. The winner of Survivor Fans vs. Fans. Parvati. Thank you guys for watching. If you are not subscribed for whatever reason, then what the heck are you doing? Smash that subscribe button right now. And why don't you leave a like as well, along with a comment of your favorite villain in Survivor history. With all that said, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.